Well, this was originally supposed to be a talk with myself and uh, Dr. Uh, Meg Flores. She's ill tonight. She couldn't make it, so I'm going to do the talk. Um, she and I put together the slides and <clears throat> have worked together for the last few years. Um, we do, um, we've been doing some research in um, timeout, and um, we published a paper on timeout and child and family behavior therapy earlier this year. And we're doing some other timeout related things. Um, but since she, she told me yesterday that, in, in effect, that this talk wasn't going to happen, and so I just totally took it off my mental calendar, and then this morning I was told that rather than call 78 people and tell them that we were changing the day, would I please come and do the talk? And so then I kind of had to get geared up for it again, and then when I was doing it, I redid a bunch of the slides. So the slide set that you have isn't exactly the slide set that you'll see, but you'll see most of that slide set. And I added a few slides from some other talks and did a little editing. Um, and it gave me a, a chance to um, change all of uh, Dr. Flores' slides that I didn't like because she's not here to defend herself. So, <laughs> so um, all we need to do is advance the slides and we'll be set. Now, one of the things that I won't do is um, I'll use the slides primarily as cues for me um, to remind me of what to say, so I won't necessarily read everything that's on, on the slide. So the slides are kind of a guide for me. Um, this is something, this is in your, in your set, but it's in a different spot. I, I moved it because um, I think it, one of the really important things that you have to do, um, as, especially if you have two parents, um, is that everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody has to kind of, whatever the program is, Everybody's got to do it. Otherwise, you really can't evaluate the program. And sometimes you have parents that they disagree. Uh, maybe they have a child on medication, and maybe one parent is in favor of medication, and the other parent doesn't want medication. You see that in ADHD kids fairly often. Um, and sometimes you have one parent that's more of a disciplinarian, so to speak, than the other. Um, and so there is, uh, you know, disciplining and parenting children is one of those areas that really. Um, creates a lot of stress in marriages. Before you have kids, it's just kind of like playtime. But then when you have kids, you really have to get together and figure out how you're going to do it. And, and you really need to agree on it. And if you don't agree on it, then I think you're going to have a hard time implementing anything consistently. And if you don't implement it consistently, then your chances of success will go way down. Something else that I think is really important, um, if you want the, uh, the behavior of children to change, um, they aren't going to change it because they think it's in their best interests to do so. You know, they're, they're kind of used to doing what they do, and what they do works for them, even though for us it may seem like it's really um, inappropriate or would be um, unpleasant. Uh, you have to figure there's something that maintains kids' behavior. Um, and so, in a sense, um, their behavior is fine just the way it is from their point of view. Um, so it really needs to be parents that make the changes. And this is true even, I think, with older kids, because parents can take the long view, and kids don't take the long view. So as a parent, you can, you can come into um, a, a session um, looking for suggestions or advice, um, and you can try it out because you've got a lot at stake, because you're going to have your child over the next many years, and then, of course, they're going to want uh, so to lead a, an independent life of their own, we would hope. Um, so you have a lot invested, but the kids don't. So the kids aren't going to take the first step. You need to take the first step. Okay, um, this is really part of a, a, a talk that I often give to um, a pediatric residents uh, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, and that talk is really uh, common parenting pitfalls. I like the alliteration, but we changed it here a little bit. Um, so these are among the things that I talk about. I don't know if we'll get to all of these things or not because it's um, several minutes after six now, um, and we're going to want to have some time at the end for questions and answers. But um, during the evening, if you have a question and you want to raise your hand, I, I'm fine with that. So just you know, grab my attention, and then um, and I'll see if I can um, you know, answer your question. Okay, so we'll start with um, one of the common pitfalls is interpreting behavior. I hear this all the time. Um, if I, it's one of those things, if, if I had a buck for every time somebody said, why is he so angry, um, I could retire. Um, he just does it to make me mad. Uh, there are all kinds of um, interpretations of, of, 
uh, kids' behavior. And I think uh, one of the problems with interpretations is that you can have as many interpretations as you've got people in the room. You just can't, can't agree on that. I mean, you, you can agree on the crying. You can agree on there's a tantrum. You can agree on um, he or she may be aggressive. But the, the whole idea of what drives that, what makes that behavior go, um, you know, what's really going, but what's really going on. Uh, I had a, an occasion, this is several years ago, I, do, I work with a lot of kids with elimination disorders and somebody in town was interested in working with elimination disorders and so this person called me on the phone and they wanted to come and <clears throat> get my advice as to what do you do with kids that have um, ankle preses, they soil, whatever. And so we had about a 45 minute conversation in my office because uh, there's a whole way of dealing with those kids. And, and at the end of it, he said, yeah, but what do you do with what's really going on? And I thought, what's really going on is that this kid has ankle presis. And if you do these things, we can fix that. But it's, it, there had to be more to the story. And I think that's, that's a mistake. And I think the more you get involved in interpreting behavior, the harder it is for you to be able to fix behavior. So I would instead ask, under what, condition, under what conditions does behavior occur? This is, this is the key point. Um, what precedes it, then you have behavior, and what follows it. And so when I, when I have a, uh, um, a child that has problem behavior, what I'm looking for is what shapes that behavior and what maintains that behavior now. And I, and I figure that um, what we're going to be able to do is identify those things that shape and maintain behavior, and, and those are going to be the controlling variables, technically speaking, and we're going to manipulate those, and then we're going to try and change the behavior. So the contingencies that shape and maintain behavior, you know, one of the things that I do a lot, and we'll talk about here, um, and this would be true for an awful lot of people who work with young children, um, I use my attention as a tool to shape childhood behavior. And attention is a very, very, very powerful tool. Um, I lost my place for a second, wait a minute. Well, it will come back. All right. So we'll go on, and when I think of that, then I'll, I'll make the point. The, the, the point about using um, attention as a tool to shape behavior, attention is probably the most, it, it, it's a tool that you've got with you all the time. So you can use it all the time. So you want to sprinkle it on kids a lot. Um, and, and here it is, this is what was going to happen. So I'll, I'll, in clinic, one of the things we'll do is we'll teach parents to give their attention different looks. Um, instead of always praising children, sometimes we'll pat them, sometimes we'll give them a rub, sometimes we'll just describe what they're doing. Sometimes um, if, if you, if you um, don't know what to do and you want to um, interact with a child, you can just describe what they're doing. You can just go, you're sitting there, look at you sit. And you've got a handout and a bottle of water. And little kids just go, Oh, wow, you know, like they love that. Okay, but if I go up to a little kid um, to like, give attention, maybe to give a pat or a rub or something like that, and the little kid goes like this, then I think, what are the con contingencies that shape and maintain that behavior? All right, well, it's really no different for all kinds of other behavior. It's just oftentimes less obvious. So we want to find out what leads to what, and a lot of times we don't have those kinds of clues that people are getting in defensive mode when you get close. But if you, if you see that, that's always a concern. <clears throat> then you've got parental expectations. Um, I like um, my, you know, name, name the uh, age. My child is really smart. So, so when I'm talking to parents about, they have to be careful, one of our topics will be um, having discussions with children, and dis uh, children aren't really going to use uh, the information they get in discussions, at least that's, that's my viewpoint. Um, and I'll tell parents that, you know, a lot of times you have a discussion with a child and you've got some important thing to say to them, some rule, some point, some moral. Um, and you're going to give that to them, um, but they probably aren't going to really may be able to take advantage of that because they're just young and developmentally speaking, they aren't going to make use of that information. But that's when I hear, well, you know, that's true for most kids. But my kid, my kid is really smart. Um, and I hear that a lot. And I think, um, and this is actually my kid. And, um, and, uh, and she's reading Skinner and she's only, um, but I think that um, when you're talking about little kids um, and thinking that they're going to learn what I say and then they're going to follow the rules. I'll just set up a rule. I'll set up a rule and then they will follow it. Well, if that were true, nobody would be here. 
because everybody has, has, has told their kids, you know, do this, don't do that, but, there, but that doesn't always work, obviously, and so there needs to be some other things that we need to do. Um, and a lot of times what happens when you get into that, does she know she's not supposed to do that? Um, this is really a function of t um, uh, enunciating a rule for kids and not following it up with really significant consequences. And so instead what you do is you're, you're in, in a sense, tossing your attention across the room instead of you know, going up to them and delivering something. But you're saying, you know, stop it, don't do that. And in the world of children, we just delivered attention. And the fact that we might look at that attention as being unpleasant or aversive or negative or however you want to put it, in the world of children, it doesn't function that way. In the world of children, it's like, yeah, yeah, I just got attention. Every time I climb on the furniture, mom says, get off the furniture. But that's maintaining that behavior, would be my guess. Now, sometimes people engage, the kids, kids will engage in, paper, uh, in behavior because um, it's fun, like jumping off of the furniture might be fun, or playing in the bathtub is fun. Not, not everything is maintained by parental attention. But parental attention is huge, and when you tell kids, don't do this, don't do that, and they keep doing it and doing it and doing it, I would say it's not because they're trying to press your buttons, it's not because they're trying to get your goat, it's because they've learned, as they do, what leads to what. And they have learned that when I jump off the furniture, I get mom's attention. And in the world of children, what will happen is that, and you might even catch yourselves doing this, when your kids are playing quietly by themselves, then we don't pay any attention to them. And when they, when they do something wild and crazy, then we're all over that. So kids learn what leads to what. And they learn that if I'm playing quietly in the corner, nobody's going to pay attention to me. But if I do something that's really uh, irritating, um, oftentimes health and safety related, then I'll get, I'll get mom's attention. For that. It's almost as though, and this is kind of getting ahead, but I like to think of it as though kids have an attention tank just like you have a gas tank. And, um, and you can't see the gauge on the kid's tank, but they never let it run dry. And, it's, and, and, and as a parent, you might think of it in terms of if you have a gas gauge on your car and it's broken, and I don't know, if, I, I ask this question of a lot of parents. An awful lot of parents have cars that don't have gas gauges. I'm just amazed at this. But I, I also have driven a car that didn't have a gas gauge that worked. And when you're in that situation, you put gas in the tank periodically, whether you need it or not, because to run out of gas is just really bad news. So periodically, you're putting gas in the tank. You should periodically put attention in the attention tank. And because when it runs down into the red zone, kids will try and fill their tank, and they'll do it by doing something wild and crazy. And that'll be, they'll go to the top of the list of the things that get attention. You can teach kids to ask for attention, to say, listen, I'd like to have some time with you. That's, that's not difficult to do. That's actually fairly easily done. But um, most people don't do that. And so they fall into this, when the kids are, are, are playing quietly, then I get to pay the bills, I get to make a phone call, I get to read the newspaper, I get to do something else. And then a period of time passes, and the kids don't have any attention, and then they want attention. And what are the most reliable ways of getting attention? They're the ways that bug you the most. They're the health and safety issues, the ones that are just, you know, like I can't stand it when he or she does whatever. So when we want, this is really part of the um, uh, expectations. Um, you need to make sure that if you're going to expect your children to engage in a certain behavior, that the behavior is actually in the repertoire of the child. That's, that's not always the case. So sometimes what you're really talking about is um, I want them to do something. Let's say it's, uh, let's say it's to clean your room. I want you to clean your room. Um, and they may not know how to clean a room. They may not know what that is. They may not know the steps. So that's a skill in a, set, in a sense. And if they don't have the skill, then you need to break the skill down uh, into little bits and pieces, the task analysis, and then teach them the skill step by step by step by step. And then once they have the skill, then it really becomes a question of motivating them to perform it. It's the difference between um, um, a skill deficit and a performance deficit. So when they have the skills and they don't do it, then you're looking at the performance of the skill and then you're looking for what are the controlling variables for that. And that usually comes down to just being something that's motivational. Right? I mean, kids may not like to make their bed, um, but we might be able to motivate them to do so if cleaning the room means closing the hamper and making the bed and, you know, you have three or four things. What I recommend, especially because the kids that I see are, are you know, are by definition a clinic population, I'll have parents write it down. So they'll have uh, three or four things, um, and then when they want to check on the task, for example, they'll go, well, did you do this? Did you clean the bed, make the bed? Did you, did you, did you? And then they can check it off, and then they know. 
Anyway, if it's not in the repertoire, you've got to develop it. The way to do that is through a task analysis, breaking it down into little pieces. And then the whole thing about children being concrete, again, this is going to get into uh, discussions, um, which will be one of the next things coming up. And um, so you just can't talk to them about mom the flag and apple pie and expect that that's going to, that's going to really carry the day. And, and they tend to be very short-term focused, too. So for example, um, the behavior of children is very much dominated by like here. Um, and it's not dominated by if you get your homework done every day this week, then on Friday we can do something. When I work with kids that have homework problems, I want the homework to be done today. And to, there's something riding on today. We can have something as a bonus at the end of the week if somebody wants to do that. But you need to have something that's today. It has to be immediate. You want to have immediate consequences. This, I really can't um, cite the source for the slide, and I apologize for that. But I borrowed this from a friend, Dr. Rayland, down at the Med Center. Um, and we were looking for the source for it today, and we just, we just couldn't dig it up. Um, but what this really says is, these are great kids in grade you know, 7 through 12, then you've got what the sample size is. And then I don't know how they measured concrete, quite frankly. So that's you know, kind of a wild card here. Um, but you can see that even as kids go through high school, they still tend to be um, pretty concrete. And there's a, there's a um, um, uh, psychologist named Russell Barkley who works a lot with um, ADHD kids. And uh, he, he has um, an idea that he refers to as the event horizon for kids. Um, and it's, you know, at what point in time does an event become really salient for children? Uh, and for young children, it's like right now. And as you have, many of you have young children, um, Oh, what did we do? Well, but we have somebody here who's watching who knows there's a problem, and he will probably be out momentarily. So I'm not sure what to do with it. There we go. Um, so those of you, I, I must have just clicked on a button here by accident. Um, those of you who have um, children, when, you, when, you, when they start doing homework, then you'll find, thanks. Um, then you'll find that, um, They'll come to you and they'll um, want you to help them with uh, finding a, a source. Um, this is usually you know, Sunday night at like 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. And then you ask them, well, how long have they had this assignment? Well, they've had this assignment like forever. It's been like, for, they've known about it for three or four weeks. And even when you're in high school, and even people who are in, in college, I mean, a lot of times people wait until the last minute. Things don't really get salient until like they get really, really very close. Um, so when you're dealing with children, you're really dealing with the here and now. Um, and that's why with the really young children, if you just describe what they're doing, it's like, wow, this is the here and now. This is what we share. You're talking about my shoes? That's great. Um, I love this. It's just such a shame that Gary Larson um, has retired. Uh, but this is, this is what I think of discussions for kids. What you should do, and here's, here's the real, here's the take home point on this. Discussions for children translate into one on one time with mom or one on one time with dad. And what could be better than that? So, and these are the kinds of discussions, they almost always take place when misbehavior has occurred. So now we've got the reliable pairing of misbehavior and a parental discussion. And so if you were a child, you'd be thinking, geez, this is a good deal. Um, even if you were getting, you know, I've told you 10 times, 20 times. That's yeah, but you know, like we're going for 21, and they'll do it. Um, but if you have something important to say, and a lot of parents, they feel as though they have a, a, an idea or a value or something that they want to communicate, then I would do that at a time when things are going smoothly. I would do that at bedtime or after bath or sometime when things are, are calm, when your child is engaging in appropriate and adaptive behavior, and then I would have this little moral nugget. Because what happens is that when you have discussions with kids, you have, you have um, two components. You have the content of the discussion, and then you have the attention component. And they always get the attention, even if they don't get the content. So what we're trying to do is deliver the content, but they're not getting it. Uh, so you know, when you're an adult, you can get content via a memo. You don't need the attention piece. You just need, you just need the email. And you get the, you get the content right there. But for little kids, you're going to be talking to them, and they're not going to get the content, in my view, 
um, they're going to get the attention, and that attention is very powerful, and it's going to maintain a lot of behavior. So if you have something that you want to tell them, tell them at a time when they're doing something that you think, you know what, if they don't get the content, at least I'm not maintaining disruptive behavior, aggressive behavior, tantrum behavior, something of that sort. At least I'm maintaining uh, playing quietly or uh, engaging in cooperative uh, uh, play with a sibling or something like that. So we've really kind of gone through this whole d discussions piece. But I think that a lot of times, this is what you get. You're maintaining a lot of inappropriate behavior. Um, and, and you don't need to do that. So I, I really, when we, get, when we start talking about um, uh, uh, time out and shaping by consequences, which we're coming up right here, um, I really like to keep things short and um, really, really pretty clear. So when we're talking about little kids learning, then you're really talking about a lot of practice trials, and then you need to have different kinds of outcomes. So that uh, when they have appropriate and adaptive behavior, you've got one kind of outcome. And when they, when they have inappropriate uh, and maladaptive behavior, you have another kind of outcome. So if you, if you, if you take, and this is really a, you know, a premise of mine, um, that uh, attention is, is, is so key for kids that I think of um, sprinkling attention on kids, um, little, little bits of attention, just for two or three seconds at a time. So when I'm talking about using your, your attention with your kids, I'm not talking about going to the zoo for two or three hours. I mean, that's a great activity. But in that two or three hour uh, episode, you're interacting with your child all the time. And all those little, little interactions, you ought to be thinking about, what was my child doing when I interacted with them? I mean, he, he uh, you know, w was climbing up on the wall or was uh, you know, throwing things into the exhibit. And if you go stop that, that may not function as as um, a, a motivator for him to not do it. You keep in mind that you can terminate a lot of ongoing behavior just by yelling at somebody. I mean, you just go, stop, don't. I mean, you can do that. But what you really want to do is look at the trend line. What's the trend line over days and weeks and months? Because if, really, if that was going to be effective, then again, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here because everybody's done that and kids continue to misbehave anyway. So. Um, you have to look at the trend line. That's why you need to have different kinds of consequences. If you, if you read to somebody, uh, which is a great activity, but if you read to your kids for 10 minutes at night, that's a 10 minute interaction. That's, that's good time. But you could break that up into two or three second bits, and you'd have a couple of hundred bits, and then you could sprinkle that on a lot of other kinds of behavior that you want to adapt and maintain. So I look at it almost as though um, you've got a behavioral garden and you're going to sprinkle the behavior that you want to see with attention and you're not going to sprinkle the behavior you don't want to see. You're going to try and ignore it if you can. It's hard. Ignoring is a skill and you know some people can do it and some people can't do it. I mean, you just have to go to the grocery store and you can see some people can ignore their kids and their kids are disruptive and they can do it and other people they can't. They're attending to them. And, and, at any rate, and then the behavior that you think, you know, I can't ignore that. Then we have um, other kinds of consequences for that. For young children, I recommend time out. But for older kids, you've got rule of privilege. And, and, well, there's just so many ways that you can uh, uh, intertwine uh, these uh, different uh, uh, strategies. But one of the things you're going to want to have is the differential outcomes. And I just think that if, you, if, if for example, um, you're working with young kids, um, and there's a behavior that you want to um, try and um, increase or develop or maintain, however you want to put that, uh, I, I think you don't want to say, um, gee, you're doing a good job there. And then go on with like, wait a minute, that's just in the ongoing conversation, there's nothing there. I tell parents, what you want to do is have enough affect so that if your neighbors saw you, you'd be embarrassed. So you want to go, you are really paying attention. Yes, you are. Just like that. Because um, then the kids are like, oh. But instead, if I'm just talking like this, and I'm talking to you, and then I say, nice job, and then I keep talking to you, well, it's like, that gets lost in the shuffle. So you need to have something that's really noticeable. And when you have misbehavior, then you have to figure, if I'm going to correct this, if it needs to be corrected, like running in the street, or, um, or holding a railing, or uh, you know, wearing a helmet, helmet when kids ride their bikes. There's a lot out these days on concussion. I do a lot of concussion kids, so I'm very sensitive to that. Anyway, you need to have differential outcomes. You've got, I often talk to parents about you've got the good news and the bad news. 
And uh, you, know, you, know, you need to know um, when to use the good news and when to use the bad news. I, th I think the, um, what people do typically is that, in a sense, this sounds terrible, but in a sense, they're oftentimes, they're looking for a bigger stick. They're looking for, I've tried this and I've tried this and that doesn't work and spanks don't work and I've taken away all these privileges and this doesn't work and that doesn't work. Um, I really think that what you need to do um, I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. Um, we've tried everything, nothing works. Positive reinforcement doesn't work. That old behavior speak, I hate that language, but I use it all the time at work, but I don't usually use it with parents. Um, but this, the positive uh, consequences for behavior, that's the most important thing. People come in looking for aversive consequences. They come in looking for ways to discourage their kids from engaging in behavior that's either dangerous or they can't stand it or they just don't want to see it for whatever reason. And that's really what they're looking for. And I think what you really need to do is, oh, that's another good one. It's like, no, the, no, he really likes liver and onions. No, just call him, he'll come. Um, You've got positive consequences and punitive consequences, and you've got the combination. And, I, and this is, uh, I use this line with my, with my families all the time. Um, it's carrots and sticks. It's, it's that traditional carrots and sticks, and what you need is a bushel full of carrots and a couple of sticks. So you really need to try and do the positive stuff, and the positive stuff is hard to do. And I, I can't tell you the number of people who've, um, and this, I know that I've skipped through some of the slides, I don't know if you've, you've seen it or not, but um, the number of people who I've put on one program or another, or they're coming in for the first time, and they go, geez, we've done all that, and that stuff works for about two weeks. That program works for about two weeks. I put my kid on a sticker chart that worked for two weeks, or I put him on a point system so he cleaned his room, and that lasted about two weeks. There's an awful lot of that out there, um, but when you have something like that, and you can change the behavior of a child, then you know, you know, I've got something here that's effective. How do I keep it effective? How do, I, how do I keep it fresh? Now that I know that I can move a child's behavior as a function of the consequences, how can I keep those consequences fresh so that they're still motivating for children? It doesn't mean that that approach won't work. Because you've already demonstrated, probably, that that approach worked, because it worked for a couple of weeks. But keeping it fresh, that's hard to do. OK, now I'm going to go back. to creating difficult discriminations because this is one of the common parenting pitfalls. There's something that I see a lot, and I see it out in the community and I see it in clinic. With little kids, like two, three, four, and they're just kind of playing with their parents. And so, so we're talking about something, and you know, so they'll have their child like this and you know, be doing one of these things. And then they're, and, and the kid kind of does one of these kind of little slap things, and the parents are, oh, isn't that cute? Um, and then, at some point, they really clock dad. <laughs> and, now, and now dad's mad about it. And I'm thinking, well, whose fault is that? That's not the child's fault. It's our fault because we've created a difficult discrimination. And little kids, they don't know that, well, we're just playing, so I need to pull my punches, in a sense. So you need to be careful about creating um, those kinds of situations where kids, in effect, will break a rule, but it's not really their fault that they broke the rule because it was hard for them to actually see what the rule was. So when I, when I first started, um, years and years ago, I had, uh, this is just another example of difficult discriminations. I had um, a, a sprocket-driven printer where you'd have a box of printer paper and you'd thread this on the sprocket and then it would come through, I mean, you know. I mean, if that's not, if that's not dating myself, I don't know what it is. Um, anyway, anyway um, and, it would, and so you'd print something out and it would start off with a blank sheet and it would end with a blank sheet. And so then I used to save these blank sheets. And then I would bring the blank sheets home and I'd let my kids you know, play with those blank sheets. I never gave them something that was scrap paper that was, well, you can play, you can use this side, because there was you know, um, a paper or a grant or a proposal or something, and it was like just a draft. So you can play it with the other side. Because they can't tell the difference between when this is a, a grant proposal that you're putting in the mail tomorrow morning, 
and this is an old draft that they can play with. And then you pick it up and there's coloring on it. Well, whose fault is that? That's my fault. So instead it was, it has to be black on both sides. If it's black on both sides, you can play with it. But if there's any writing on it at all, you can't. So problem solved. And I, and, I, and I do a lot of this with, with kids. So uh, another really good example is, well, let's say you're working in the kitchen and you're making, um, you're making dinner and you've got, you know, you've got the hot grease or boiling water, all that kind of stuff. And so you're working there and your kids come up and they're like, you know, do the pants leg thing or whatever. And, and you want them like to, to be safe because, you know, the spatter and all this kind of stuff. So you can tell them, well, you need to get out of the kitchen. I'm working here, you need to get out of the kitchen. Yeah, but what does that mean? Does that mean like physically out of the kitchen? Or some now kitchens are really kind of ambiguous spaces. I mean, they blend into other spaces, so it's hard to know. So what you can do, and I, I've, done, I've recommended this and I've actually done this. Uh, you know, like take a, take a well-defined, um, like a, um, um, a crack or a separation in tile or even a, like masking tape, and you put that down and then here for, here, for example, you probably can't see that, but there's, there's like an electrical outlet here and there's like a, a, a grid over it. Um, and so you could have, you know, like, this is in the kitchen and this is out of the kitchen. And so when, you, when your kids are in and you, and, you, and you say, get out of the kitchen, then they go back like this. And sometimes they'll even, sometimes they'll even do this. And then they <laughs> lean and go, you know, like, yeah, but what about... But, now, but it's, now, it's not ambiguous now, now it's clear. It's clear cut. So if they put a, a toe over it, then it, it, what I recommend and, and what, I, what I do and did, I would say, you're in the kitchen. You, you sit here until I say you can come out. And I put them in time out for that. Um, that only happens like once or twice. I mean, kids are really fast learners. Um, and then the, we don't have accidents. So um, I think uh, creating difficult discriminations, that's something that we do. It's a problem for kids because they get clobbered because um, we weren't very smart about establishing the discrimination in the first place. Um, Noncompliance, this is the number one uh, referral to clinics. Um, it it's, uh, leads to a lot of abuse. Um, and we see a lot of non-compliant kids and a lot of disruptive kids. Um, we try and find out what's going on. Um, I can observe them in my office, but what's going on at home and at school? Um, and sometimes they'll even ask, well, if, if, if you asked Johnny to do 10 things, how many of those things would he do the first time you asked them? And usually it's very well, like one or none or two. Um, or he might do three or four, but I'd have to ask him, you know, like 10 times, which is, which is, so, so this is very common. Um, what happens a lot of times is that um, we tell kids to do things again and again and again and again. So then what happens is it's like, well, I don't have to do it. Well, why not? Well, this is only the fourth time he asked me. He'll come back at least several more times. I'll do it when he comes back on the eighth time, because that's when he starts to get mad and red in the face. Right? So it's important because the compliance issue is important because at some point you're going to ask kids to do things, whether it's going to be um, uh, cut the grass or um, maybe toilet training. I mean, I do uh, uh, this intensive toilet training, toilet training in the day kind of routine, but we, I like to refer to it as toilet training in the weekend because it gives you like an extra, an extra little leeway day. Um, but when you do that, you have a lot of structured sits for kids. And if you're going to have a structured sit, then you've got to have a kid that's going to sit. You can't have a kid that says, I'll do it two or three times, but you know, like now I'm bored. Now I'm out of here. Now let's play chase me games. Now let's struggle. Now let's arch the back and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so if, for all the interventions, whether you're talking about sleep problems or bath or you know, at the dinner table or who knows what, at some point you're asking children to do things. And so compliance gets to be huge because uh, what will happen is that um, when you put demands on kids, a lot of times they'll try and get away. They'll have a tantrum or they'll run. Um, sometimes they'll hit, and then, uh, then if you ask them to do something, and then they hit you, and you go, well, okay, fine, I'll do it myself. Oh, now where are you? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very tough road to go down. So as we, the positive stuff, this is where to start. When you, when you have, uh, just to recapitulate that point, when you have um, a problem, 
you need to start someplace and you need to find something and this is, you can find this in, in any, any child because children just aren't a constant misbehavior machine. I mean, a lot of times when even if they're driving you crazy, they're being appropriate and adaptive. But you have to start somewhere and you have to find behavior that you can attend to, that, that you can try and shape that behavior and see more of it. And one way to look at it is that the more time um, our children spend engaged in adaptive and appropriate behavior, the less time they have to spend doing the goofy stuff because there's just only so many hours in the day. The, the downside with that argument is, which I like that argument a lot, but the downside with it is you only have to set one fire. It doesn't take very long. So you, know, you can't have some behavior that's really very dangerous, but most of the time you don't have that. Praise and attention, we talked about that. Um, Frequent bursts throughout the day. This four to one ratio, this is just a um, um, kind of a reminder. This really, really comes more out of the um, uh, marital therapy literature. But um, there's been a lot of work done on what's the ratio of positive comments to negative comments. Um, and so, the, you know, like time, sometimes you'll find people that, that are, are in a bad relationship, they're critical of each other. Uh, I'm sure that never happens to anybody that's here, but it has happened. I know it has happened. And sometimes we're pretty critical of our kids. And so they find that the ratio of four positive statements to one critical statement is like a key ratio. So, I, I mean, I, I, it, it just makes good, good sense to be more on the plus side than to be on the negative side. I mean, if you want to stay married, then you know, if you don't want to stay married, just turn that around. But, so, it, so we should remember that for our kids, too. And remember, our kids need little bursts of attention throughout the day, um, you know, all the time. Um, and it really, really makes a difference. And for those of you who have children um, in daycare or in preschools, um, when you go to pick them up, you, you just start attending to the other kids. You, you, you just, you, again, you can just tell them you've got green shoes. And they go, oh. And uh, you just give them a little bit of attention. And then pretty soon you'll be like the Pied Piper because kids really like attention. And you can, you can see how their behavior changes as a function of that attention. This is an old standby, and I'll tell you, a timeout is a great routine. Um, there are a number of, uh, of people that I've run into that they've had a hard time making timeout work. Um, and I think you can always, well, not always, but you can almost always uh, make timeout work. You can always tune up timeout. And um, I recommend timeout. Um, it has um, a lot of really nice qualities to it. Um, first of all, um, it's not scary for kids. So spanks are scary. Um, uh, meet me out back of the garage while I get the canoe paddle. That's scary. <laughs> and when you ask kids to do that, they're not going to come. They're, gonna, they're, they're, they're headed out. They're gone because it's, it's scary. So um, there's not that. And it's very doable because you're only going to ask them to sit for a, a number of minutes. Um, and so it's not scary and it's doable. It leaves no <laughs> marks. Okay. Um, you know, I run into a lot of people who tell me that um, they're estranged from their parents or they haven't seen their parents, the adults, the, adults, the parents in my clinic. Um, they haven't spoken to, you know, their mother or their father or haven't visited them in years. And I'll go, so where does your dad live? And they'll go, hey, Council Bluffs. Because there's something that, in that history that, that estranged that. That's, I mean, I just think it's terrible. But I've never heard anybody say, oh, man. I had to sit on the step for five minutes. Ugh, I'm never going to talk to that guy again. You never hear that. You never hear that with timeout. And timeout passes the Walmart test. Because if you're going to, if you're going to be out at the grocery store and you're going to start using Spanx and whacking your kids, that's a real problem. It's, and it's not just a problem for the child. It could be a real problem for you because somebody's going to step in and say, hey, what are you doing? But nobody's going to do that if you say, I told you not to touch the bananas. Now stand here until I say you can come out. And then you stand here. And then like half a minute or a minute later, because you do shorter durations in public places, um, then you say, okay, come on now. Right. So we do a lot of timeout. Timeout doesn't have to be, well, it doesn't have anything to do with chairs, you know, first of all. And sometimes people will do this. I don't, I don't usually like to do this, but I do this sometimes. Um, timeout, in effect, means you're going to take everything away from the child that's, that has any, any um, relationship to good news. You're taking away attention 
and you're taking away, you know, of course, television and you know, any other kinds of activities, no toys in time out, no books in time out, none of that stuff. And you take away all that so that, so that in a sense, you want your child to be in a stimulus void, right? So that there's nothing going on. So it's really, so it's really um, like uh, you're, you're waiting in the deli line, and the person in front of you says, "I'll just try, just let me, tr just let me try that a little bit." And you're thinking, "I got to get out of here." And this person's having lunch on free samples, and you're in now because you're in timeout. So kids don't like to be in timeout, um, but sometimes. If parents have a hard time putting kids in timeout because they struggle or they run, um, sometimes they'll take away a, a toy. Um, sometimes kids can just watch other kids play. I, I, I don't typically do this, but I, but I have. Um, when child number one is in timeout, then I'll get child number two, and I'll get child number one's favorite activity, and we'll just engage in that activity while child number one is, is watching. That's like a contingent observation. This is, um, you know, it can be the step, it can be the corner, it can be a chair, but there's nothing magic about chairs. Again, the thing about timeout is that what you really want to have is your child has done something that you're thinking, this needs to be corrected and I just can't ignore it. I've got to do something else. And so what am I going to do? And the list of, of um, uh, punitive uh, strategies is fairly short. There aren't very many. I mean, you can take away privileges. You can spank. A lot of people spank. I, I mean, I don't recommend spanking. We could do an, an hour just on spanking. Um, but a lot of people do. I don't think people are thugs because they spank their children. I mean, a lot of people in the community do. I don't think it's a good idea, but people do that. Um, but you're looking for something that is handy that I can deliver it right now when the misbehavior occurs. Not when I get home. Not when dad comes home. Not, you know, none of that. I can deliver it right now and, that, and timeout does it. Because you can even do timeout in the car. You can just say, I told you not to hit your sister, you're in timeout. You turn off the radio and you have silence. The kids just sit here like, what, I'm, wait, I'm in the car. But, but what happens over a period of time, if you use timeout, and you use timeout specifically, it, you know, I don't care what you call it, you can call it thinking time or whatever you want. Um, as soon as you say it, then from the kids, you get a little, uh. So it's like you're driving down, down the street, and uh, the cops pull up behind you, and the siren goes on, you're just Rawr. As soon as you hear that, you're like, uh. And that might just be there to tell you that, um, you know, I think you're gonna get a flat tire here, and I want to bring that to your attention, or you got a bubble in your tire, or who knows what, and you go, oh, thanks. But you're so conditioned to, when you hear that or see that stimulus, the squad car, that it's like, oh, what have I done? I mean, I, and same thing with timeout. So as soon as you say timeout, you get a little bang for the buck. So if you're in the car and you're only going to do it for like half a minute, or you're in a grocery store and you're only going to do it for half a minute, that's better than nothing. It was immediate. It was contingent. You were totally in control. You put the kids in. You take the kids out. Um, and so you get something out of that. Now, I, that's not as, as good as having somebody, you know, like uh, sit over there or, or stand here or sit in that back seat. It doesn't make any difference where you do it. But it's really you're removing things from the child's environment. Um, so there's nothing magic about chairs or sitting or even time out. It's just that time out is a very convenient way of delivering the bad news when kids goof up. Yeah. Um, I just have a quick question. What do you do? A child um, is in timeout and they are doing like harmful behavior to themselves. Well, that's a that's a tough one, you know. And there's there's I've got something here. Uh, don't be beguiled into turning time out into time in. Uh, it would depend upon what they were doing. So 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 if you had somebody that was engaged in significant self injury, like you had somebody that was developmentally delayed. Um, oh, yeah. Like I work in a daycare. Sometimes they'll like bite themselves or like bang their head against the wall. And yeah, well, you know, those are, those are very difficult situations. They're very difficult situations for me professionally, and here's why. Um, let's say you, know, uh, you have a child and the child's sitting in timeout, and, and, and then they start like biting themselves. And then, if you start, and then if you say, whoa, don't do that, or you can come out of timeout, not one. Well, I mean, I, 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 the idea is, you know, when, when I have p kids that um, headbang, and sometimes uh, this will come up like early on, and it's like, uh, it's, you, maybe you're involved uh, in it with a family, and then they say, and you know something else he just started doing? He started hitting his head. Then I'm thinking, we want to try and ignore that right away. 
Now, it depends upon if they're banging down the cement and all that. But it's easy to shape it up. It's easy to shape it up to a point where you can't ignore it, where then you have to um, uh, 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 get a helmet, perhaps. I mean, you can get prescriptions for helmets for kids. Um, and then as soon as you see them banging their head, then you put a helmet on them. Um, so if it's, a, if it's an attention getter or it's, or it's escape based, I can get out of time out by engaging in this behavior because um, I'll freak out the staff and then the staff won't know what to do, then they'll continue to do that. And then, it, and then, and then what happens, and this happens I think with kids that really go ballistic, um, and, and sometimes you wonder how this happens, but you get to a point where, where the kids are engaging in a behavior and, and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to ignore it. I'm just going to ignore it. And then they ratchet it up. And now they get it to a point where you can't ignore it. And you go, stop! And now that's the new set point. And then you go, you know, this time I'm really going to ignore it. I mean, really, I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> and what happens when, you, when something is, is, is maintained, and then we ignore it, then it, it takes a while for people to figure out that the game has changed, that the rules are different. So you'll typically see a, a burst of behavior. It'll get louder, wilder, crazier. Um, before it starts to decline. And so you can, you can just shape up behavior so that you, you, sometimes you think, gee, what happened? He was fine just a second ago, and now all of a sudden he just has a total meltdown. Probably didn't start that way. Probably it's been a, a series of steps over a long period of time, and that's been shaped and it's been maintained by people in their environment. So when you have somebody that has a really dangerous behavior, that's a real concern. You have to think about, um, Maybe I don't want to use timeout. Maybe I want to use some other kind of um, a timeout procedure besides like sh uh, chair timeout. So for example, you can have um, non-exclusionary, well, what do we, maybe we have it in here. Um, there are a, a number of um, procedures that you can use where you have kids that are very difficult to put in timeout, or you don't want to restrain them, or you don't want to spank them, or you don't want to do putbacks like they get out and you put them in, out, in, out, in, out, in. Um, uh, the, the paper I wrote with Meg Flores um, has to do with just this very issue. Um, I don't believe in restraining kids. When you restrain kids, somebody gets hurt. It, it could easily be you, or it could easily be the kid. Um, and I don't do the spank thing, um, and I don't do putbacks. You know, I mean, I, I have colleagues that use putbacks in clinic, and, and I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of people I see, it's like a single parent, and, and like, are they going to be able to do putbacks? Are they going to do this, like, for 30 times or 40 times, and, and like, you're breaking into a sweat and you're losing weight while you're doing it? Um, I just think, I think that's not very practical. So I try, and, I try and work around that. And so if I had that case, if you were trying to put a kid in timeout and he started biting or hitting his head or something like that, um, I would go to another, another kind of intervention. And so one of those interventions can be, um, you could take a picture, you could take a picture of the child. Um, or, or you could have, you know, it, I mean, it depends upon how verbal people are. Um, but you have some kind of symbol, you know, and you hold it up. This is not an uncommon procedure, really. And when, when you see this, then you're in time in, in effect, time in, time out. And so, so like the candy store is open when you're in time in. You have access to attention. You have access to toys and all kinds of activities. And then when, when you need to correct the kid, you go, OK, fine. You're in time out. And now it's not exclusionary. But now what you have to be able to do is control the environment or control key aspects to the environment. And in the procedure that Meg and I wrote up um, called deferred time out, um, it really only works for a, a certain portion of the population. But you're talking about working with children. Um, who really can't mediate their own environment. If you have somebody that can really mediate their own environment, then this, this wouldn't work very well. But with deferred timeout, I just say, okay, you're in timeout. And until you give me timeout, you're not going to get any TV, and you're not going to get any snacks, and you're not going to go outside and play, and you're not going to do any of that stuff. So you tell me when you're ready. And then they're usually like, hey, great, because I, you know, I don't have to go to timeout. But at some point, they come back to you because they want something. And at that point, you go, well, first you give me timeout, then we'll talk about this other stuff. So it's really a timeout training procedure because it's removed in time from the, from the uh, breaking of the rule, so it's not as good for that. But once they're trained, then you can use it as a, as a response reduction procedure. But you'll hear all this kind of stuff, you know, because kids, don't, kids uh, want to get out of timeout. One thing I never do is, like, I never, I mean, when I have timeout procedure, I put them in, I take them out. I don't say, you can come out when you calm down, you can come out when you're ready. 
I have a procedure like that, but it's not a timeout procedure. I have a procedure like that for kids that engage in what, what for lack of a better term, we would just call rude behavior. Like they're going to pick their nose. Like, well, if you're going to pick your nose, you're not going to do it at the dinner table. Right? So like when you're finished picking your nose, then you can come back and eat. But I'm, I'm telling you, you're not going to do it here. But it's not really like a timeout offense, because it's not really like, you know, like wrong or bad or, I mean, there are a whole slew of those kinds of things that I would say, um, you need to go away and do that someplace else, not here, but you can come back when you're ready. But for time out, you put them in, you take them out. Yeah. What's recommended for uh, the start of the acting up period, you know, the 17 month, 18 month, uh, the ability to reason's not quite there. Not uh, quite there. I would say it's a long way from there. Right. And, and, and so, um, you know, putting in a time out or something like that, which you don't want to try to establish or we've tried to establish, uh, and then, you know, remo they remove themselves from the situation, you're in the putback situation. Mm -hmm. um, what's the recommended best procedure in a situation like that? Yeah, I use, um, for little kids, first of all, I, use, I start timeout, I recommend timeout when kids can cruise. So, you know, I don't worry about, um, she's not gonna understand why she's in timeout, so what's the point of that? Um, you know, uh, she sticks her finger in an electric socket, and, and then I, I say, and this is something that I did, and, and again, it, has to, it uses you know, consistent use of terms, um, but it would be, um, you know, that is a don't touch, so you're in timeout. Because um, little kids really can't do too many things, you know, really, but they can't get hurt in that sort of way. Um, and then for those kids, for the little kids, I'll swing their legs out and I'll plop them on the floor, and I'll just kind of cross their arms, and I'll count to like 15 or 20 seconds. Um, they hate that. They hate it. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, you know, you don't want to compress the vertebra when you put them on the floor. You know, right? um, so you have to be careful with that. But um, th that's the only time when I would try and re um, restrain little kids. Um, and eventually, I think, you know, time out is, um, well, if they get a little bit older, then you can, then you can kind of go to a, like more of a deferred time out if you need to do that. Um, and, but, but those are all not as good as starting when they're really young. And the, and the important thing, the importance, again, I, I can't overstress this. This isn't just for PR purposes. Um, using positive consequences is the most important thing. It's hard to do. But that's, that's what you need to do to really shape behavior. Because there's all kinds of behavior out there um, that you'd like to shape and maintain over a period of time. There just aren't that many things that you, you, know, you kind of don't want to do. Um, but the positive stuff, it, you know, kind of comes down, um, uh, tell them what you want them to do, not what you want them to don't, in a sense. And so you use time out for these you know, transgressions. Um, but you're spending a lot of time with just, when you're going from one place to another, you're just doing a little of this. You're just doing this, patty on the head. Just, oh, there you go. You've got blocks. Oh, wow. And then you, I mean, you do it. You would just be, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. Yeah. I don't recommend restraining them or whatever. Yeah. Um, my daughter, she started out with throwing herself on the floor, trying to hit her head on the wall and stuff, but now she does it to me. How old is she? Three. She does it to me. She'll hit me or punch me or start to throw stuff at my face or. Mm -hmm. So well, usually I do hold her down and I just hold her in my lap. How long? How long has she been doing it? No, how long you hold? Uh, until she stops. Uh huh. Well, I mean, because because one of the problems with that, and one of the one of the ideas behind having very young children and doing like a little restraint thing if they're not going to sit in a chair for you for a very brief period of time, is that. Um, that in and of itself can maintain the very behavior that you're trying to get rid of because you have a lot of kids who, they like the struggle. I mean, that's half the fun. And, when you, and you get kids at a certain age, and what they'll want to do is, is play these kind of struggle games, whether they're uh, wrestling on the floor, or um, you're, you know, you're, you're in the shallow end, and it's like, you know, see if I can get away, hold me. I mean, that, that's fun for a lot of those kids. So, um, so you really have to be careful about, um, Re about restraining um, you know, her in that manner for any length of time. Um, or she might just, she might think of it as a cuddle. I mean, I saw something in the World Herald one time and it said, you know, um, hold your child on your lap and tell them this is your time out. I just thought, that's just crazy. Well, I mean, because that's just gonna maintain the very behavior you're trying to get rid of. So, um, but, for, but for some of these cases, it's conceivable that, you know, there was something that I don't do typically, um, 
But then I do sometimes, um, and you could take toys and put toys in time out. She might have a favorite, like a favorite teddy bear or a favorite uh, blanket or something. And you go, you, you know what? I'm putting your blanket in time out. But eventually the goal is you want, her, you want to be able to tell her, you want to have place time out. Time out is where I say it is, and it's right here, and you sit there until I say you come out. And if, and if you tell them to sit there and they stand, or you tell them to stand there and they sit, I don't, I'm not worried about it. I mean, that's just, that's really small stuff. Right. Um, but part of having you put them in and you take them out and really, you know, that puts you in control of the procedure. And one of the things we want to do with kids is, is have kids under instructional control, which, you know, sounds so like, uh, you know, Machiavellian. But we want to tell them to do stuff. You know, pick up your toys, hang up your jacket, you know, clear your, clear your dishes. We don't want them to go, forget it, you do it. Well, I mean, you know, that's kind of where you'd be. Um, you know, warnings, well, you can have warnings, but warnings are a slippery slope. You know, because if you're going to warn kids, I mean, I, I know an awful lot of people say, listen, you need to do this or you're going to go to timeout. I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but it's like, no, I really mean it, you're going to go to timeout. No, I mean, really. And, and so then, you know, pretty soon, it's the first time you tell them it doesn't mean anything. Or, or if they're going to hit their brother, then you better make the first one count, in, in a sense, because I'm going to get one hit for free. So you know, <laughs> so you got to watch out for that. Watch out for the warnings. But um, if you keep it, if you just limit it to a, a, one warning, I don't think that's a problem. And for aggression, you know, for hits, you know, I don't say. You know, I mean, it, it's just easy to just go. You know, like time out. There's no warnings. So, like just you go sit. Um, I really think it's important you t you put them in, and you take them out. Um, and every time um, you say, you don't get out until you're quiet, or stop screaming, or any of that stuff, they're in time in, not in time out. 